This is a focus leader. Do your movies look like this? Do your soundtracks sound like this? Or like this? If so, you need this. A focus leader. First, set your lens so that these lines are sharp and clear on all parts of the screen. Now, set the volume control on your projector. The sound level should be adjusted until my voice can be clearly understood in all sections of the room. You are now ready to participate in another Pan American Travel Adventure. from your destination, cruising gently. Your mind tingles with excitement. And that's how it is. Your adventure starts when you walk into the plane. Your visit to Japan begins even before you get there. As you sit now, relaxed, talking some more with your old friends, Friends you met just the night before. So little my country, but so much to do, to see, to learn. Well, it is just that we wish to be understood. Cities, scenery, all very fine. And all very close at 600 miles an hour. Forgive. Must not spoil own adventure. But to know my country, see my people too, please. So you flew the Pacific, 6,000 miles, and now you're here. Fujiyama, Japan. You're so excited you pay scant attention to your Japanese seatmate's last minute plea. Remember, to know my country, see my people too, please. Sure, you promise, sure. But you're landing. You're down. A few formalities at the airport, and you're ready. You're off for town, the big town. Tokyo. Tokyo. Tokyo? It isn't quite what you expected. No, not what you expected at all. Except that the traffic keeps to the left, why, this could be anywhere. Chicago, New York, Rome, or Rio. All that traveling for this? And the people, they're Japanese, all right. But are they Japan? Is this Japan? Even when you do catch a glimpse of the kind of thing you expected, it's just as lost and bewildered as you are. No. No, Tokyo's too big, too busy to tackle, first of all. So you head out of town, to the quieter places you've read about, and to meet the people. After all, remember, you promised to know my country, see my people too, please. You make up your mind to stop at the first inn whose porters flag you down. Ah, this is more like it. This is the politeness you'd been expecting and the different customs you'd heard about. 
you're not just seeing them, you're taking part in them. And now you meet ceremonial tradition, politeness, most humble politeness. No, that's not right. Politeness is cold, impersonal. This is truly graciousness. They make you feel not like a paying visitor, but like an honored guest of a family. With my people, a meal is a ceremony. The surroundings of the dinner are as important as the food. For the hunger for beauty must be fed too. We enjoy not only the taste of the food, but the balance of the colors of the different meats and fish. And we will say, honorable guest, forgive our humble efforts, so unworthy of the honor you pay our house. Forgive these poor offerings. But examine the bowl, priceless, like everything else, like the picture in the Takonoma. For dessert, nature seemingly brought indoors as a window becomes a picture frame. For this is Japan, where nature is made to obey the rules of art, where brooks are made to curb with grace and ponds designed to fit bridges. Trees shaped to frame an island, their young branches hung with weights to persuade them into proper lines for frames. And even Fuji begins to look as if he were shaped by art. Then you begin to see him as the ideal of all this land. In all nature, the one perfect and final creation. You're in a real picture book land, yes. But when you look a little closer at the picture, you realize each little patchwork in the design is an entire farm. Beautiful, yes. But the people tell you, much beauty, too little land. 80% mountain, only 20% soil. Each of us must take up every inch of his topsoil every three years and refine it through his fingers. So very little must go a long way. A little rice, a little grain, and so many people. And what the land does not give, we must take from the sea. When evening creeps down the mountains, the work with the land has to stop. But the work of the day isn't over. Dusk brings no rest for the weary. For at evening, the fishing boats come back. The self-same people who labor in the fields go down to the docks to help with the heaving and hauling and handling. What the land cannot give, we must take from the sea or starve. And at long last, the farm and fishing village goes to sleep. But long before you're up and on your way again, they're hauling the fishing boats out to sea.
strange that one fish should be eaten and others being sacred are fed. Strange that some people must work to live and others have play as their living. They are geishas. Their teacher tells you their story. I make artists in music, deportment, fine writing, arrangement of flowers, singing and dancing. I accept them for training at six. At 18, they are graduated. Suppose you are director of bank in Kyoto and you give fine dinner for merchants from Osaka. You call geishas. They serve in the proper way, make right conversation, speak of art and of poetry, sing, dance. They are Japanese tradition. And traditionally, each year the most skillful geishas appear in the great cherry festival at Kyoto. you meet everywhere you go. Festivals and children. And both are enchanting. The girls and boys doing the things kids do all over the world. On special days, tradition transforms them from just kids to tiny samurai warriors. celebrating a festival of their very own. Festivals for everything. For setting insects free to hear them sing, for lantern lighting, for harvests. But the solemnity that puzzles you at first always comes out fun. Just kids all dressed up and playing parade acting out the past, or having it acted out for them by the wandering minstrel, the traveling teller of old tales with his paper slide theater. And what does it cost to hear a fairy tale? Just a piece of penny candy. By now, this unusual land has begun to capture you. Not yet do you understand it quite, but you begin to sense the spirit behind it. For everywhere there are shrines, great and small, Buddhist and Shinto. What is a shrine? a Jizo image on a hillside, nestling a private offering of incense at his feet. A giant Buddha looming to the sky, hearing the prayers of pilgrims by the thousands as they trek to Kamakura. A Torii gate in the inland sea, or a lantern of bronze, should the fortune teller sell you a prophecy that's bad, you hang it on the lantern and forget it. A shrine, a place of prayer. Each spot on earth's a shrine. A rock, a tree, the silver sea. In all, great and small, resides the divine. A prayer can be silent. A pebble picked up on the shore and placed in the lap of the Buddha to protect the soul of your child. Let my child be strong like the pine, clever like the sacred fox, 
Noble as the ancestor warriors, brave against spirits of evil. What will be, will be. Yet grant, O Buddha, after my child be born, that the banner of the carp may fly over the house of my husband. The banner of the carp, like so much in Japan, is a symbol. What it means, you learn from a little boy on your way. Means boy, because carp is strong fish, jumps upstream against current. Over my house, little carp me, big one, big brother. Everything in Japan means something. Now take the devil-masked bugaku dancer on the inland sea with his ceremonial gestures. He's not just a dancer, he's a Shinto priest. And each motion, each step, summons down the spirits. For Shinto worships the spirits in things. And as he calls upon the great god of the waters, you too feel the magic in nature around you. And now your mind's eye summons to memory Fujisan, symbol of all you have so far seen, of different faiths and gods and ways of worship. Summoner of spirits, he had you enchanted. You almost forgot he was just a man. Your pilgrimage goes on. The true milestones on your way to understanding are the people you meet. Centuries ago, along this, the old Tokaido Road, the warrior knights, the daimyo, used to make their annual pilgrimage to the emperor at Kyoto. Today, little boys and girls retrace their ancestors' steps along the self-same road. Do they know its traditions? Do they know what it means? Do they know? Yes, they know. Just like his country, living with the past, yet running with the present. But the youngsters aren't the only ones who relive the tales of times long gone. Grown-ups play at that game as well. You leave the actors and their camera crew to their retakes and take up again your pilgrimage into what makes this country tick. By now, you think you have it pretty well figured out, at least in terms of its people. Consider this tiny land, so much manicured into gardens, where a dying leaf is plucked from the tree before it mars the perfection. They know its beauty. They've made a tradition of arranging that beauty. This is where it began, the art of arrangement. Where but here could one flower mean man, the second flower earth, the third heaven, 
and the whole tradition. They know the beauty of their land, for their shoulders bend to its burdens. And their sea, an island people hemmed in by water, its depths mean the difference between enough and too little. So they pound the prows of their boats to frighten fish to the nets. They use the shallows, too. For the weeds of the waters are food for life, as well as its fruits. Amma, they're called, these girls of the sea. As their sisters cultivate the shallows of the paddies for rice, so they harvest the floor of the sea for edible weeds. And dry themselves by a fire of straw. Legend says the gods of Japan meet each year to decide the fortunes of the year to come. Of the eight million gods, only one does not attend the god of the sea. He has to stay home. Not even for one day can the waters fail to yield their fruits. Tradition. It colors their lives as it underlies their ways of work. Modern and bright as their textiles are when you shop for them in the cities, in the brookside villages, they fix the colors fast in the age-old ways. And it's man and the work of his hands that lies behind the beauty of pottery, even when machinery helps the work along. It's here, on the outskirts of Kyoto, you size up Japan. Here it comes into perspective, this land that has clung to the ways of the past yet industrialized itself almost overnight. It's an alloy, this country. Its people have forged their metal of equal parts. The new and the old. And when you get into Kyoto itself, it all begins to fall in line. Modern streets, yes, but even traffic makes way for tradition. Once again a festival, this time to celebrate the blossoming of the hollyhocks. Now, the glimpses you catch begin to add up. Again you see geishas, prosaically shopping for groceries. Sure, they have storefronts and plate glass galore. But nowhere else in your travels have you seen such beauty for the buying. Yes, the old and the new. You have to see both sides of the picture. Together, they make up the true Japan. That's your yardstick. And the old that you see, it isn't set apart. It's embedded right in the present, like the traditional water festival in the public park. Modern Japan that moves you back toward Tokyo over the inland sea. What's new for you is that you've learned something. You can relax. You can take time out for the timeless.
again, you move a while by rail. You make a pleasant stopover at a lakeside inn. Its counterpart, the comfortable, the new, is everywhere. Just as everywhere you go, there is the old, the cultural. A many-faceted beauty of color and form and symbolism. Jewels of art and architecture, of painting and sculpture. Some you've never so much as heard of before. Others you've known all your life. With so much of the real Japan behind you, you're ready to tackle busy Tokyo again. How will it seem to you now? Will the old and the new meet and balance each other here, too? Will it? Well, there's the Emperor's Palace Wall, right off the busiest street. People doing their everyday things, in the everyday kind of way. And even here, the old, old festivals. The main idea in this one is to let the will of the gods determine which way the shrine will go. The same fervid passion can carry over from yesterday's excitement to today's sport. Same people, different game. Yes, your measuring stick is accurate, your figuring is true. Truly, you've come to the crossroads of the East and the West. But you learned it, really, from the people going about their daily business, whether in shirt sleeves or kimonos, sandals or wedgies. Modern as they are today on the outside, inside, it's both together. You have to meet both on your journey, if your journey's end is to be understanding. <laughs> He knew that when you first saw His Majesty. But Fuji keeps silent. He tells nothing. You have to learn. You have to find out for yourself. You have to go.